Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I just want to take a, a brief moment to welcome everyone. I'm Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center. It's fantastic to see so many of you out here for the talk today. Uh, just a quick note, if you haven't been to any of our events before, we do have a sign-up sheet where you can join our email list to be notified by events of this in the future. And I now want to turn it over to Rosen, who's going to host today's event, and we'll introduce our speaker today. So Rosen, take it away. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. So um, even though even though I've met Nariman before, I was on, and, and actually extended this invitation some time ago, I was only properly introduced to him in absentia last year, uh, much of which I spent at Oxford. Uh, now, you know, in my experience, Oxford people aren't the most, uh, are quite difficult to impress, <laughs> especially for the, right, for the right reasons. But Nariman's fame resounded through the uh, through the house of the Slavonic Languages Department and, and beyond. The dissertation he wrote there served as the basis of a book, The Cinema of Tarkovsky, Labyrinths of Space and Time, which established itself as the definitive work on Tarkovsky. It came out in 2012 from Isaac Torres. In it, uh, Nariman tackles the paradoxes of Tarkovsky's cinema, the prolonged time, intercut with leaps and irrational cuts, and the dogmatism of the characters, which get, gets cancelled out by the, by the uncertainty of spirit. Subsequently, he moved to Stanford and embarked on his next project, uh, uh, section of which we will hear, uh, Reorientalism, uh, Late Modernism and the Late Soviet State, about how the Soviet avant-garde of the 1920s turned to the East, to Central Asia in the 1930s. Platonov, Andrei Platonov, a writer to whom Nariman has devoted a number of articles, is a prominent figure in this project, but so are Eisenstein, various formalist figures, and the constructivists such as Rochinka and Stepanova. In a sense, uh, this work uh, will unite two previously Key streams of uh, uh, will unite two key streams of scholarship that he had previously not intersected: studies of Soviet modernism, uh, on the one hand, a nation building in the Caucasus and Central Asia, with uh, with its attendant cultural projects. There is a third uh, project already in Nariman's head about <coughs> the reconce reconceptualization of folklore throughout the Soviet republics of the 1930s. But there are also a number of side interests to which he has devoted numerous articles. Prigov and Moscow conceptualism, post-Soviet art, Zygavertov, and many others. Each of, the, each of the, uh, these he, he approaches with immense passion and theoretical prowess. So let me end here and uh, leave it to you, Nariman. Thank you, Rosen, for this flattering and flattening introduction. Um, so it's, as Rosen mentioned, this is my uh, uh, part of the, the, uh, this section is part of my book, and it's, it's, I'm still working on it, so any kind of theoretical challenges would be appreciated. So, uh, and it's even a pleasure to be here. I, I love New York, and it's wonderful here, so thanks for having me. So in 1925, Alexander Rochenko represented the Soviet Union with his design of Workers' Club at the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts. In, in his letter from Paris addressed to his partner, Varvara Stepanova, he writes the following lines. The light from the East is not only the liberation of workers. The light from the East is the new relation to the person, to woman, to things. Our things in our hands must be equals, comrades, and not these black and mournful slaves as they are here." Unquote. Rochenko, while using an emancipatory rhetoric, establishes a new set of affective relationships with the world of things by glorifying what Christina Kair identifies as the comradely object of socialist modernity. Seven years prior to Rochenko's private exchange, the phrase appeared as the title of Joseph Stalin's article uh, in Light from the East, published in Pravda as an unsigned editorial, Stalin describes the growing proletarian resistance to the national bourgeoisie in the Baltic state. I quote, 
Slowly but surely, the tide of the liberation movement is rolling from the east to west into the occupied regions. At the center of all these stupendous developments is the standard bearer of world revolution, Soviet Russia, inspiring workers and peasants of the oppressed peoples uh, with faith and victory, and supporting their liberation struggle for the benefit of world socialism." Unquote. Stalin emphatically concludes his article in the following manner. Light is coming from the East. The West, with its imperialist cannibals, has become a breeding ground of darkness and slavery. The task is to destroy this breeding ground to the joy and comfort of the working people of all countries. Stalin identifies the revolution as an annihilator of the old order of things, which to him, as well as to Rochenka, is a source of darkness and slavery. The Latin phrase ex orienta lux originally refers to the sun rising in the East. Thus, one can argue that East functions, functions as a point of origination and as a point of orientation. However, the stance would undergo a substantial modification in the mid-1930s. Russia, as an oriental luminary, would transform, or rather will be reoriented towards its own orient, the republics of Central Asia. It would assume a role of the enlightening westernizing force while building socialism in one country. My talk today attempts to trace how constructivism not, not just yielded to the external political pressure in the 1930s. I will try to argue that its proponents adapted the K aesthetic principles in line with ideological demands of the epoch. So I would like to start by identifying key features of Russian constructivism as it flourished in the 1920s. Christina Lauder influentially defines the, the movement as an artistic practice with an approach to working with materials within a certain conception of their potential as active participants in the process of social and political transformation. Constructivists set, set out to re realize the communist expression of material structures. And constructivism as a movement aimed to disrupt sets of binary pairs such as art and reality and contemplation and production. Constructivist spatial structures which were made from real materials with a pronounced industrial emphasis were produced by the artist constructor and the artist engineer. Factory as a collective enterprise and antithesis to bourgeois individualism was a, an ultimate locus. It was a source of the creative force in the world. Art and life no longer comprised a binary pair. Mass production and industry merged them into one entity. Um, Rochenko, Rochenko's and Stepanova's early artistic preoccupation with material formation of the object uh, repudiated any form of unprincipled aesthetic decoration. At Futamas, higher art and technical studios, Rochenka trained specialists for the metal producing industry in the field of the material formation of the object and the artistic treatment of the metal, having in view the application of this new knowledge and skill to a new culture of life and to the mass production of artistically designed goods. Material formation of the object is a key phrase here, for it defines the early impulse of constructivism. Maria Gauss' analysis suggests that the constructivist notion of factura underwent a transformation from an anti-authorial materiological determination to a more conventional functionalism. Material ceased to determine form and evolved into a practical entity. I quote, factura, as a principle of materiological determination, form follows material, was replaced by a nascent functionalism, form follows function." Unquote. I will argue that the factura will undergo a further modification in the 1930s when it will enter the sphere of symbolic unity, uh, utility through the practice of photomontage. But before I do that, I would like to reflect on a very similar shift in thinking of one of the key theorists of the avant-garde form of the 1920s, Viktor Shklovsky. Shklovsky reorients re himself in the, 19, in the late 1920s when constructivism was already fading away, when, when constructivism was already fading away as a movement. He accomplishes a substantial di discursive leap from the notion of materials that passively waits to be modified to human artistic engagement with tools. The defemorized theme of the 1910s, teens, uh, as an object of perception was replaced by the artifact whose Materiality was pronounced so that its material structure could be better apprehended in the 1920s. In potboiler work, Badonshina, for instance, drawing from his experience as a military mechanic, he claimed 
and understanding that aluminum is shaggy, nickel is slippery, and cast iron feels somehow greasy to the, to the touch. Tactile and strange encounters with different metal metals signal a move toward concrete material perceptibility, <coughs> not a mere abstract mental perception. The physical encounter with matter, which derives from the Latin materia, meaning wood in the sense of material, replaces detached cerebral experience. As a consequence, in the, in the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s, the tangible qualities of real objects and substances become, became a new avenue of, for the development of Shklovsky's concept of astranenia, defenorization. So matter is inherent qualities and, and the idiosyncratic perception of these qualities by an individual who is consuming or interacting with them are paramount. One can even discern this tendency in Zoo or Letter is Not About Love, in which critics insist on the importance of interacting with things as tools. Theodore Adorner's assertion that we are not to philo philosophize about concrete things, we are to philosophize rather out of those things, can easily be applied to Shklovsky during that period, when he attempted to conceive the human object relation as a prosthetic alliance and mutual dependence, and consequently developed it into an intricate technological relationship. Here, the process of defamiliarization is fundamentally dependent on the interaction between the perceiving and acting human subject and the material world. In his introductory letter thematically addressing the issue of how things reconstitute the human being, he writes, and here's a quote, a tool not only extends the arm of a man, but also makes him an extension of itself. They say that a blind, blind man localizes his sense of touch in the end of his cane. What changes a man most of all is the machine. The machine gunner and the counterbasses are extensions of the instruments. A weapon makes a man bolder. A horse turns him into a cavalryman. Things make of a man whatever he makes from them. Speed requires a goal. Things are multiplying around us. There are ten or even a hundred times more of them now than there were 200 years ago. Mankind has them under control, but the individual man does not. The individual needs to master the mystery of machines. A new romanticism is needed for machines, or machines will throw people out of life on the curves. Here the thing rejoins the acting and perceiving agent. While technology, machines developed from the application of scientific knowledge and aesthetic craftsmanship, drastically changes the nature of the human relationship with the inanimate world. Chklovsky does not simply argue for the prosthetic dependence of machine gunners and, and uh, counterbassists, but asserts that each of the pair, the warrior or musician and his or her tool, actualize each other's capabilities. The critic presents a version of the new materialism that views technological and natural substances as actors whose essence cannot be reduced to the meanings, intentions, and symbolic significance impo imposed on them by the humans. The thing object transforms the human being. It turns him or her into an operator, an organic extension of itself. Shklovsky concludes his line of reasoning by asserting that the field of technology belongs to a truly aesthetic realm. It is a new romantic mode of being in the world. However, tools are gradually become irrelevant. With the emergence of the Stahanovite movement, it is the shop worker, not the tool, who becomes an ultimate subject of socialist realist art. This comprised an entry into the sphere of human psyche and the sphere of the symbolic. Factory as a real place of production work where art and life merged becomes an object of contemplation in the 1930s. The entry into the sphere of symbolic was assisted by the practice of photo montage. For Christina Lauder, the failure of constructivism to transform the human habitat in a radical manner for the design objects did not enter into mass production, forced them to reorient create their creative impulse towards smaller scale typographical poster and exhibition design tasks. This was an, an inadvertent return into the realm of the aesthetic. Lauder argues that photo montage was a logical continuation of the technological aesthetics that the constructivists propagated real palpable object was replaced with it, its photographic impression. However, this changed a product of aesthetic, uh, however, this, chain, uh, this changed a product of aesthetic evolution. Artistically, the use of the photograph was based on and developed from the experiments in collage, which had also formed the basis for the emergence of no, non-utilitarian constructions. So one can observe a certain continuity here. 
For Rochenka, photograph is the is a nexus of artistic and real. Unusual tilted viewpoints of his photographic images performed a complex function. In his own words, in order to teach man to look in a new way, it is necessary to photograph ordinary familiar objects from totally unexpected viewpoints and in unexpected positions, and to photograph new objects from various vantage points so as to give a complete impression of the object. We are taught to look into a routine in, in, calculated, uh, in, in, in calculated manner. We must discover the visible world. We must revolutionize our visual thinking. We must remove the cataract from the, our eyes. The camera was the means to change the usual way of looking at things because Brochenko argued the lens of the camera is the pupil of the eye of the cultured man in socialist society. Rochenko used the photograph not as a means of straightforward social or political propaganda, but as a means of visual re-education. His aim was to expand human awareness of the environment. The mechanized eye of the camera, the visual machine, was to act as the educative eye of socialist man or woman, that is, to enable him or her to perceive reality through the machine. In this approach, Rochenko could be seen to have acknowledged still further the restraints of reality and the need for a very prolonged propaganda and educational process to create the prerequisites for the concept of design. However, with the emergence of photo montage, political propaganda replaced the goal of visual re-education. Uh, this, uh, this is how um, photo montage is defined in, in the left editorial. By photo montage, we mean the use of the photographic print as a figurative means. The combination of photographs changes the composition of, gra of graphic images. The, meanings, uh, the meaning of this change is that the photograph is not the drawing of a visual fact, but the exact fixation of it. This precision and documentary quality give the photograph a power to influence the viewer that the graphic image is never able to attain. So this comprised a substantial move the enlightening educational power of the photograph is replaced with the ideological impact of photo montage. As a result, photo montage was crucial for the movement's productive engagement with the realism of the socialist realist aesthetic framework. Photographic image was a compromise with the, that powerful move towards realism and the attempt to create a popular Soviet art. The mechanical and objective fixation of reality in photography and its use in photo montage tended ultimately to reinforce the influence of the real object which was depicted and which formed its subject matter. The photograph provided a way of being realistic without resorting to painterly realism, but at the same time it gradually eroded the constructivist principles with which it was initially manipulated. The photograph and photo montage therefore were at once a symptom and the cause of the decline of constructivism and its increasing compromise with existing as opposed to projected reality. However, I would like to argue that the constructivist experiments of the 1920s found their constructive application in the 1930s when the, movement, uh, when the movement's key figures contributed to the formation of Soviet subjectivity. The experience was in indispensable for the process of construction of the Stalinist psyche. Construction of a socialist society left the realm of the real and entered the sphere of representation. Material construction is replaced by the construction of the imagery. The utilitarian things of, the, of Russian constructivism entered the symbolic field. This is evident if we look at Trochenko and Stepanova's design of the 10 years of Uzbekistan album. Uh, and here is uh, one of the images. In 1933, they were commissioned to produce a lux luxurious folio to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the formation of the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic. At the time, the Central Asian Republic was seen as a, an exemplary space. Its inherent emptiness was filled, by, uh, filled in by means of construction, a new home for the emerging Uzbek proletariat built during the first five-year plan. By the mid-1930s, after 10 years of intense construction, this home had to be uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, filled with symbolically meaningful content. 10 years of Uzbekistan created and endorsed this meaning. <coughs> and as you can see, like, you, you, you already see this kind of classic shift from kind of 
Lenin as a monument, so that he becomes Leninism and, and Stalin as a kind of real figure. What, what is interesting here, we have, of course, Lenin kind of shot from that kind of constructivist records, while Stalin kind of is uh, more or less uh, kind of depicted in a more or less re uh, realist manner. So the result is an impressive graphic design achievement. Various reproductions of, of paintings and drawings by Uzbek artists, as well as arts and crafts by anonymous artisans, were reproduced practically in miniature, domesticating and overcoming their actual sizes. This tactic was blended with elaborate large-scale photo collages, portraits of the political elite, and textual inserts. In the resulting work, epic visual compositions literally overcome the spatial limits of the page. A great number of the works are presented on folded pages, which can be opened in every direction. Altogether, they create an intricate rhythm of the album, a typographic oriental carpet, and present Uzbekistan simultaneously as an exotic fairy tale, land, and as advanced socialist topos, an enacted utopia. And here I've got a few. So it's a huge book. I mean, this page is about like of this size. Uh, And this is kind of really a uh, peculiar uh, image. I mean, this one is, sh uh, is, is, is uh, shot on a kind of, on a, on a film. And of, of course it presents this kind of patriarchal Uzbekistan, the, uh, where kind of um, uh, women, women are guarded by this, uh, the, the, the male master. And then you, you kind of fold this page, this, this film, and the next image you see is this one the kind of liberated Uzbek women playing piano on, on, and, and their own, own masters. So the album has, has stood the test of time, but not without scars to prove it. The oriental fairy tale bears, a tangi uh, bears tangible traces of the Stalinist terror. Within a year of the book's publication, the political establishment of the USSR was subject to violent repressions, and many of the individuals whose portraits proudly adorned the album's pages were purged. Rochenka and Stepanova's two personal copies registered the, the rupture that took place. The artist defaced with India ink the faces and names of those who fell out of political grace and ceased to exist. With the passage of time, this purely practical solution for the possession of books with photographs of enemies of the people was a punishable crime, evolves into a radical aesthetic gesture. The obscuring ink stains conceal the victims of Stalinism. At the same time, these blank spaces profoundly reveal the horror of the, move, of the moment, for the dark void is an arresting representation of an all-consuming animal fear. This was a Stalinist black space, a dark corner of extermination, compromising the mimetic procedure that, uh, and, and, and competing with its representational radicalism with Kazimir Malevich's black square. For the Rochenko of the new left days, the human eye only saw the ordinary and imposed and had to undergo a visual revolution, re-education. He vehemently defined, defied the belly button point of view which surveys an object from the middle point of, of, of its overall dimensions. Instead, he urged photographers to capture familiar objects from acute angles and new objects from different points of view, resulting in the full conception, представление, of that object. But after Rochenka underwent his ideological and aesthetic reorientation, he became exposed to the fringes and, and became exposed to the fringes of the country, he adjusted his theoretical apparatus accordingly. The Soviet Orient, as a reservoir of unfamiliar and novel experience, did not need a raccourse. What it truly needed was a form of representation that would make it familiar and thus accomplish a, a cognitive closure. This is evident in collages and photographs showing uh, short workers and political leaders. They are all shown from this belly button point of view, as, as you can see in, in, in this example. The use of which Rochenka has resisted only a few years before. However, Rakurs still infiltrates the style of representation of, in various photographs of ordinary people, civil buildings, factories, and even mosques shot by Rochenka's followers. The two aesthetic frameworks jointly and dialectically negotiate icons of the new Soviet subjectivity and I have some examples. I mean, these are typical kind of avant-garde shots and which I also kind of included in, in, into this book. Factory.
<clears throat> the use of color filters is another aspect that can be seen as a reformulated or adapted uh, avant-garde device. The sense of monotony in the progression of the album is eliminated by means of photographs printed in brown, blue, and green. The filters are echoes of Rochenko's famous monochrome series, pure red color, pure blue color, and pure yellow color, which he accomplished in 1921, of which he wrote, I quote, I reduced painting to its logical conclusion and exhibited three canvases, red, blue, and yellow. I affirmed it's all over. Basic colors, every plane is, is a plane, and there is, and there is to be no representation. Rochenko distilled the art of painting into the primary colors from which all others can emerge. This, made, uh, this was a radical formalist experiment that could, could be said to go even further than Malevich's suprematist studies. However, in 10 years of Uzbekistan, monochromes, as the, end of the, and the, as the end of the chain of representation, evolved into photographic filters, which in turn reveal reality per se. The radical negation becomes its vehement assertion. And here, to show you like the kind of this intricate use of color filters, Varvara Stepanova's theoretical contributions uh, and further modifications are no less visible than those of her partner. Her definition of photomontage as a mode of reaffirming photographic veracity is crucial for the development of the entire industry of photo album production in the USSR. The early stage for Stepanova's vision was characterized by a multiplicity of cut photographs rearranged on a single plane. During the mature stage, the individual photographic image as a prominent manifestation of reality acquires a more independent role. A single photograph, in many cases the figure of Stalin, comes to dominate the plane, and its unbroken pre-existing relationship with reality is essential to the overall composition. Hence the need for the artist to create his or her own representation instead of utilizing existing images as building blocks. Almost all of the key photomontages in 10 years of Uzbekistan display this tendency. Finally, in her early experiments with handmade books, which blended handwritten text, uh, Zaum transcends poetry, with newspapers uh, treated as a plain surface, Stepanova subjugated the category of meaning through, through an effort of form, using texture. Later, she saw the concept of texture as a production process. It had evolved into a mechanized entity, revealing the very technological process used to produce it. The concept of texture flourishes in 10 years of Uzbekistan as an, album, uh, as an album dedicated to the mineral and agricultural riches of the Eastern Republic. Uh, the album itself is made of many rather unconventional materials such as high gloss coated paper, lithographic paper, cellophane, and colored film. But the end papers, but the end papers stand out as both the front and back are decorated by cotton buds and, and astrahan fur, karakul as you can see here. However, there is a significant difference between the two. The cotton buds are drawn, and here's so it's the, uh, the beginning and the end of the book. So the cotton buds are drawn and presented in a flat manner, while the fur is shown as a photographic close-up to emphasize, even celebrate the material's texture. The symbolic order of the drawn cotton buds is positioned against the real level of the close-up of the astrakhan fur. Here, natural resources do not simply dwell on the level of the real. The ideological symbolic uh, drawn potential is equally vital. And to conclude, Rochenko and Stepanova's album, Ten Years of Uzbekistan, reveals a peculiar blend of modernism and socialist realism. The formal language of the avant garde is in place, though slightly altered. Yet the clarity and straightforwardness of content, in line with the official style of the Soviet Union, is also manifest. The book follows the conventions of Stalinist artistic propaganda, which aspires not to not to a representation of objects and people, but to their presentation and display as hyper-real and future-oriented entities. Mimesis is made redundant, and a new type of relationship between the world and its artistic impression, where the two form an original amalgam, is advanced. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now it's our turn. Um, she's in the
met before. Um, one of the things that sort of struck me is you're starting from this point where they are committing to the reality of the real, to the thing, to the tool, mm -hmm. and then they're kind of forced to a new position where they have to uh, talk, somehow present an idea that is not yet there. I'm, I'm kind of curious about your idea of how, of how to uh, encompass that and, and how to kind of almost theorize that when you're going from the idea of the thing to this to the idea of the idea. Of course, you still have the thing, but there's still this 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 gap, and they must have been very worried about that, as you can see with the uh, the uh, black you know uh, circles on on the people who were erased. So I'm just kind of curious about that. Do you, do you see that as a kind of um, almost symbolic violence of having to leave behind the whole idea of the, the, the tool as the real object? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, I mean, it's a very, I mean, this is a kind of a core question, basically. Mm -hmm. So my, my take is, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, when I'm trying to understand what happened to the kind of Russian Soviet avant-garde, kind of which uh, really thrived in the 1920s, and I argue that it, it kind of, this modernist st strangeness uh, it found its kind of own domain in the 1930s in, the, in this sphere of national form. So that's why when I looked at kind of Zika Vierta for Eisenstein or uh, Rochenka, Stepanova, Shklovsky, they all went to Central Asia and kind of tried to play with the kind of notion of national form, which of course, as we know from Stalin's famous definition, is kind of the ultimate definition of uh, a proletarian culture, national and form, socialist and content. Mm -hmm. So here I see like the kind of how they reconcile themselves with the notion of content. Mm -hmm. This is crucial because and content becomes and I mean Shklovsky in this in this sense is kind of much more interesting because he kind of uh, tried to reformulate. I mean he wrote his monument to a scientific era in nineteen in, in nineteen thirty, right? It, it just very early capitulation. But I mean, he kind of already in that article, he tries to kind of engage with the notion of content. And in the 1930s, in his kind of uh, not very famous books like Padonshina or Poiskach uh, Optimisma, he, he really kind of tries to theorize the notion of content. So to me, that, that was a kind of, and ironically, this formal experiment uh, uh, concludes with an attempt to engage with the notion of content in the 1930s. And this is kind of, uh, I interpret the, the, the shift. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, um, my question is, um, do you know about the um, discussion in the European press approximately at the same time if, re if montage could be really published in newspaper, and they kind of um, discuss, were discussing: uh, is it um, distorting reality? Is it representing it in particular way? I, I, and some, uh, and it was a lot of controversy around when pa pa when some newspapers and periodicals published it. I think even during First World. War. I'm not really sure about mm -hmm. when it was, but it's very interesting also s to compare. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which which press? I mean, do in you know Europe. In uh, Europe, I don't. I think it's in German. I, I actually know. went sometime a couple of years ago to the lecture also about um, montage in in German in. Um, press and in European press and this mm -hmm. discussion around it. You probably f could find it mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not yeah, of course it's extreme, uh -huh. extremely sure. And especially in the context that uh, uh, Rapcore and the kind of the importance of newspaper is a kind of vehicle of the, of the truth, of the ultimate truth, and I think those discussions are very relevant. Yeah, so it's not po possible to understand who do they like knew about these um, publications in Soviet Union? Do they mm -hmm. knew about European publications? So uh, it's European newspapers took it from uh, mm -hmm. Russian artists. It's, uh, I'm not sure, but it's definitely there was kind of big discussion. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Or it's not because it's not like representing reality if you 
make one figure bigger than others, then sure. approximately it get more attention than something else. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you you discussed how you know the emptiness of Central Asia made uh, made it an ideal site for Soviet construction, but we know that. Uh, you know, it wasn't quite empty, neither was it representationally empty, and there is mm -hmm. a whole tradition of uh, uh, of representations, in, you know, starting from the imperial period and th through the 1920s uh, of Central Asia, and, you know, there is a whole tradition of exoticism, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are figures like, uh, um, sorry, I, I forget, the Vilishagin, you know, who mm -hmm. yeah, produced the whole uh, series of paintings from, uh, you know, to what was Turkmenistan then. Uh, and and uh, I'm just wondering how Stepanov and Rachinka engaged, if they mm -hmm. uh, told it this previous tradition, representational tradition, whether there was uh, on their part an explicit uh, criticism of the, say, exoticism that uh, had uh, reigned earlier, or, you know, any picking up, productive picking up of threads? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good question. I mean, the question is, like, whether the national forum, uh, you can have any form of exoticism there. So that, that, that's a very kind of, uh, kind of important question. To me, I mean, of course, the, there was, a, uh, and even the, with the avant-garde, the kind of, if you if you look at Gonchirova, if you look at Larionov, there there are moments of kind of of uh, the uh, uh, the Asian uh, component of Russian culture was really important. So it, it was nothing new. But here, and of course, they they didn't go to to Uzbekistan. So they worked with materials which were sent to them. Mm -hmm. It was purely kind of this metropolitan you metropolitan. Uh, Kind of domination, you, you just compile, you create an artifact out of uh, kind of raw aesthetic material which is sent to you from the fringes of the country. So, to me, it's I mean, the, the important question here would be like to what extent that uh, that exoticism was allowed on the kind of when you uh, when you deliver the socialist content in a, in a national form. And uh, I, I, d I don't think I have an answer yet to, to, to that question, but it's definitely uh, the, I mean, those images of, uh, of workers kind of still wearing national clothes and, but uh, uh, by kind of dom uh, using contemporary tools, like a tractor, like a, Factors, etc. So I think that this is this would be this kind of this national forum and, and uh, socialist content in, in the in the in the crude kind of way. Question about the census. Um, so when you were talking about uh, photo montage, you kind of stressed the whole idea of how uh, the goal is to reinvent human vision through the machine. And our, the idea is very much uh, about vision. Uh, the very last slide that you show are with the textures mm -hmm. uh, seems to activate our not just vision, but also our tactile sensorial, sensorial potential. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can see the trajectory from real to the symbolic that you're making. Are you also interested in making any um, argument about the way our from 20s to 30s are kind of the uh, uh, the artists were interested in our triggering triggering our senses mm -hmm. yeah. I'm thinking about Emma Wittes yeah, yeah, yeah exactly it's a beautiful book the uh, social census yeah I mean she 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 addresses the the issue there. yeah uh, I, I feel like your material is kind of also very much uh, in line with with the argument that she makes and are, I was wondering whether you are in conversation with her or yeah, my, my kind of, uh, I, I think Emma's book is wonderful and, and it does kind of uh, bring to light like kind of very important, uh, I mean it makes a very important kind of rhetorical move. Uh, for me, I mean like I'm consistently engaging with the national form, for instance like the, uh, uh, with Eisenstein the essay on national form, with uh, Zika Vertov also was thinking about national form in the 1930s, this is the kind of the most uh, Kind of rhetorically, I think it's the most dominant formula actually 
in the 1930s, that proletarian culture is national and foreign socialist in content. So, but no one really defined, I mean, there are kind of, of course, Stalin uh, uh, kind of defined it in a rudimentary form in his uh, speeches, but aesthetically it wasn't really defined. So we have those avant-garde, uh, uh, the uh, kind of, uh, uh, Zygovertov actually, as early as in 1933, I mean, he starts uh, filming his, uh, working on his uh, Three Songs of Lenin, which he then uh, uh, argues that this is purely a national informed socialism content. I mean, he starts actually working on it before the, the formula was really kind of uh, propagated. So I'm, my, my take on, on, on the kind of on the period and, 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 and on those people I'm, I'm dealing with is how they engage with that national form. Having, bearing in mind that they all kind of had to denounce the formal experiments, like all of them, Gertov, Eisenstein, Rochenko, Stepanova, Platonov, famously for his Tarabarsky Yazyk. So they all had to repent in the kind of 1930s, early 1930s, and then they try to reorient and try to engage the, the art with the notion of national form. So this is kind of my take, and I think for Emma it's kind of, it's, it's not a primary uh, topic of concern. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Katarina, you were again, but as you were talking, uh, I was thinking about uh, Rossin's comment on the idea that this is empty space that can be mm -hmm. filled, and that, that comes so much out of uh, ultimately an 18th century uh, Enlightenment view of this space as empty that can be filled in whatever way it, it should be by the enlightened viewer. And one of the things you see in uh, 18th century literature is this ode, the ode where the uh, narrator goes to this high point and looks down at Russia or whatever we're talking about, Siberia, uh, imagines it as erased, imagines it as transformed. So as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about these photographs, so many of them which have this high kind of viewpoint of, of looking down. There's, I think this is part of a, of a longer kind of um, engagement, and of course that's those odes and all that, mm -hmm. enlightenment, this is all engagement with, with Western culture, and yet at the same time, it is an engagement from the point of view of, of the center, which would make perfect sense from, from this uh, as well. Uh, so there's kind of, even as, as you're rising, you're seeing things from, from that God's eye slash state side point of view, but there's also a curious erasure mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, the, I, 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 I actually disagree that this is God's point of view. I mean, to me, it's Rakos. Right. It's like tilted viewpoint. I mean, mm -hmm. kind of approaching and actually from below, I mean, it, it dominates more, I mean, mm -hmm. th those images, kind of not from above, but from below, especially mm -hmm. like buildings and, uh, I mean, th I mean, <coughs> classical stuff. What I wanted to add, actually, that the Bolsheviks, uh, unlike what, what differentiates them from the kind of preceding uh, engagement with the Orient, is that they were really actively, I mean, in the, in the late 1920s, of course, we have uh, kind of the, the territories being uh, divided between republics. The kind of delimitation de is, is taking place. Then they built alphabets. They built the literary canons. They create, they try to theorize folkl folkloric tradition and, and kind of, so there is a, a lot of like kind of efforts were not just to uh, represent, but to kind of, uh, to organize mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, so and, 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 and that's why, of course, there was a kind of emancipatory kind of component uh, where they, they thought that they were truly uh, uh, feeling this uh, kind of uh, uh, endowing these people with agency. Mm -hmm. And who was the audience for this uh, album? Uh, I mean, the, uh, that's a good question because it was a very expensive edition. Yeah. And, uh, and definitely the kind of the establishment, the political establishment, uh, who was repressed. Was it oriented yeah. on the, uh, 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 the foreign uh, region? Uh, no, not this, al this album, I, 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 I've like seen it only in Russian. Yeah, I, I unlike USSR in construction, which was of course in, kind of presented in multiple uh, languages, and Rochenko and Stepanova, they did kind of albums for the, on, on Kazakhstan, on, I mean, there are like, 
they were actively experimenting with with, with the with, with the journal, but this one was definitely kind of it was this uh, luxurious. I mean, the folio. I don't have a kind of photograph here, but basically, it, it the book itself is presented in this red case with velvet kind of. Uh, it, it's a velvet cover. You have to kind of, and it's 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 a construction as well. So you have to kind of unwrap it in an unusual way in order to get the book out. And that was a kind of the the. There are two editions. One is a kind of simple book, and one is kind of this um, uh, kind of luxurious version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are like only like 100 copies made. Mm -hmm. And the cop I mean, I took photographs from the Rochenka and Stepanova's own book, which they kind of. What I find interesting, there is a photograph of men in the textile production. Mm. Oh, usually, yeah. it, it, this is usually not what happened in, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Russian context. Mm -hmm. uh, if, That's an interesting If, if, uh -huh. if the Russian um, uh, artists, uh, photographers wanted to show a liberated woman, they would mm -hmm. present a woman in the textile production. An exploited production. man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that's actually a good point. I mean, I, uh, I'm not sure, like, like in terms of carpet weaving, I, I thought I, I still thought that it was kind of considered to be a, like a kind of where women dominated. Women uh, dominated yeah. Yes. But yeah, it's an interesting That's observation. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But was it a women dominated field before the Soviet? Uh, I think so. it was before. It, before, but yeah. then I mean, yeah, uh, this photograph yeah shows two men engaging in labor. Yeah. It's interesting for me that I'm thinking about the mind of the artist. Perhaps because I said at the conference about the mind of the artist, of neuroscientists, psychoanalysts, and artists, okay, for two days. And this is my third day <laughs> of uh, thinking about this problem. So you never use the word colonization. This is mm -hmm. very, very interesting. But um, also, it, this, this is a period of colchose, of collectivization, and these two artists, they could not. Uh, did they really like, uh, you said this very interesting thing from negation to assertion. And this is the very basic adaptation mechanism. Mm -hmm. Did they try to adapt themselves to the uh, requirements of the environment, political and aesthetic? And what is interesting for me, what I'm listening, and perhaps may, maybe I'm wrong, that what role the Russian avant-garde representatives played in this colonization of the culture. And colonization is very often emancipation. Mm -hmm. And this is what you are saying. Can you speak about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, shift was kind of drastic because in terms of politics, another uh, key uh, motto of the 1930s is, is the possibility of building socialism in one country, right? So instead of that emancipatory drive of, of communism, you suddenly uh, the kind of your internal fringes, like uh, fringes and borders, become really important, and you are concerned with building, with consolidating one nation. So that was kind of really essential. And I think uh, when I looked at various, uh, I mean, it, they they strategies vary, like from Shklovsky's very evasive. Uh, and you, you can't really pin him down to like Platonov's really earnest uh, obsession with Turkmenistan. So uh, I think uh, from my experience, like working with Rochenko's and Stepanova's archives and kind of the theoretical writings of the time, I mean, they were probably the most cynical, actually. The, and, and Rochenko was famously kind of cynical. Uh, uh, so. That's, uh, but again, I, I try not to judge. Uh, I try to engage and to see how how they try to make those theoretical moves. But you're right. I mean, those uh, uh, they. I mean, the, the fact that they were making this book in Moscow and they didn't even kind of go to 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 uh, to, to, to the space they represent. I mean, it kind of says a lot uh, about the project. <laughs> While others, I mean, Shklovsky went to Tajikistan. He went everywhere. He. Platonov spent a substantial amount of time in Turkmenistan. Uh, Zygovertov traveled and recorded his songs, allegedly recorded, though like, uh, they, they all came from uh, literary transcripts to him. But the, the thing is that as a viewer now, mm -hmm. right, as a beholder, individual and collective, we cannot say that we don't feel it. We feel it very acutely. We, we don't that feel it. That it was a, 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 the manipulation. Oh. 
-hmm. of of the of the art object, mm -hmm. of the frame, uh, of the three dimensionality in this work, of ideological, political, aesthetic, mm -hmm. psychological space of the object. We can't say that we don't feel it, mm -hmm. right? So this is about senses. I was uh, I, I was thinking uh, um, about the biography of the thing, and and I was thinking yeah, that, that that's still what what the Russian and Stefano are trying to create here, uh, even in the thirties. But if you're saying that they didn't uh, even go to Uzbekistan, when uh, at the time of the of the magazine Dayosh, when uh, when Rochenko was uh, was. Uh, uh, Taking the photographs of the uh, of the industrial production himself, um, that was the, the the fragmentation and the biography of the thing that that was what he was fragmenting the the the, the, the view of the production. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but if he did not take these photographs, then what kind of footage did he use? How well, was it? There, that's my question. Yeah, there <laughs> a lot of I mean, uh, so we have yeah. one of the key modernist uh, avant-garde photographers, Max Pinson, living in Uzbekistan. So a lot of photographs, so they, they didn't attribute, I mean, they, um, at the end, there is a list of uh, uh, photographers whose work was used. And you can see definitely there are kind of photographs which are kind of definitely influenced by Rochenka. I mean, so you, so of, uh, none of these photographs no, None of them are taken by them. Hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so they're all, you're always curating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're curating, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even in the, my time, Asian republics and their leaders will had particular psychology. Would it be possible they just these political leaders of Uzbek Uzbekistan found these artists and personally ordered this album, not no. because well, they and invest not, no. money yeah. in this yeah. even because they want to present themselves in particular. Uh, I, <laughs> I no, I, I the the simple answer would be no because uh, they it, it was a state uh, kind of order zakaz, goslitas uh, dat. I mean the I have seen paperwork. I mean I it's just they could not buy goslitas dat. They probably could buy it too. They probably could buy. Could I mean, we, we're talking about 1934. I mean, I, I just the the elite was uh, really kind of um, not that powerful, and, and and as I said, like they were purged in in, in two years. So kind of I okay, I don't have any information about that. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh -huh. Maybe it would be helpful just to go back over the physical um, publication of the album. You mentioned a hundred copies, but. Could you tell us just a little bit more about the actual genesis of the, pro of the project and where those copies went? And then what happens mm -hmm. a few years later? Uh, are they still available or to, no, to various people? There are very few copies because they were all destroyed. They were destroyed. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's why and all documentation pertaining to this uh, edition was destroyed. Uh, the, uh, the editor of the edition was destroyed. Uh, uh, killed as well, so the that that's why I mean, and those uh, the copies I have, I mean, I I, I worked with their personal copies of Rochin and Stepanov. Uh, uh, though, like you can consult, I mean, the, you can find uh, 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 editions in uh, in uh, Petersburg in the in the, in the in the National Library, which was kind of ordinary and, and which is not stained. I mean. So you can actually go and see who who's photographs. So it was basically in a kind of in a secluded chranili uh, show, like big storage. Uh, uh, but you, you you can work with that. But uh, I saw. I mean, it's it's a rare book. I mean, I saw like one copy was sold for like ten thousand dollars like a few years ago. So there are very very few copies of that. And in terms of like production details, I don't really have much information. I mean, it's just. The basic I, I worked with kind of goes with that the uh, the documentation, but I mean it's very it's very basic. Uh, so I, and I don't think it would be possible to identify uh, kind of uh, Rochenko and Stepanova. They did a lot of projects of this type. I mean, with the USSR and construction yeah. being like the main the major kind of uh, outlet. Uh, 
and they, they also made uh, a book in the uh, uh, in, in the late 1940s about Kazakhstan where there are no even not, not a single avant-garde trace so it's kind of really interesting to compare these two editions mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I, I attended the Jewish Museum exhibit which is there and I really urge you mm -hmm. to go to it mm -hmm. by Chagall Lezitsky and Malevich, mm -hmm. and in and Malevich proclaims the, the text that you said: mm -hmm. uh, no representation, the end of representation, and we re re reducing colors to three, and uh, so our and that school that they had, which is in it's it's just about the three years of the school at Chagall started, and the, the two others became also professors at, and the students did not uh, attend the classes of Chagall. They switched to the other two. Mm -hmm. it, it's very sad that Chagall leaves, and they get one graduating class, and then they're, they're, the school is dissolved, and they all go back to Moscow. And uh, You're talking about the Vitebsk school, right? Mm -hmm. yes. The what? Vitebsk, Vitebsk school. school, right? Yes, I yes. don't know what the yes. word is you're saying. Vitebsk, uh, it's a town. Uh, oh, the Belarus now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, so these guys are not the uh, beginners of those, uh, in other words, aren't, are they students of that school? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, the, the quote you referred to, it was not by Malevich, it was by Rochenko when he reduced the representation to basic colors. So I would argue that that was when you kind of present a plane, a color plane, even there is no square, there is no, it, it's just a plane. So that's kind of radical. And uh, of course they were aware of Malaysia, I mean they're kind of just, uh, it's, a, it's a milieu, it's a, uh -huh. but I, I uh, they later, I mean there was a, uh, in Hook, where all those debates were taking place, where kind of constructivism basically emerged, and they were kind of struggling against Kandinsky and his kind of psychology, the color psychology, and etc. So that was the turn from that kind of the, the end of the representation, and then you turn to object, you turn to material kind of construction, to to things, and that was a kind of radical uh, uh, domain where key theorists would be would be probably Boris Arvatov. Uh, well, I'm not I, sure if I'm answering your question. The two sentences that you named were are, appear in the exhibit as Malevich's words. Uh, that's so, yeah, I, I need to go in and, and see. I and want you to go and see. Yeah. It's such a fascinating yeah, exhibit because I, I, I understand what you're saying and uh, the startling mm -hmm. point for me is the, the, the opening slide that you had of the two Stalins and the one on the right with the tapestry or the uh -huh. embroidery, that, the, that's the exoticism mm -hmm. and the orientalism. And I can't, I was expecting to see more of that in the album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the only, I mean, and here it's actually, so the, uh, how do you call it, so it's basically the Stalin's uh, face, it, uh, it, it, it's a cut through. So that's why you, you see, like, on one page you see, like, a quote about the national form, and you kind of, when you, uh, put the page on it, you see his profile with the text, but on the other uh, page you've got a Turk, uh, Uzbek carpet, so when you turn it on that page you see him kind of exposed with this background. Uh, so it's a kind of, uh, Stalin is hollow, so, and you fill him with, with content, <laughs> either textual or uh, ornamental. And asking questions, but it's so fascinating. Uh, so, the destruction of the book, the physical destruction of the book, was it because the elite had been purged, or yeah. was it because of the um, because of the uh, avant-garde nature? Was it oh no, no, no. The, that was the avant-garde nature was kind of uh, almost irrelevant. I mean, and the book actually kind of signifies the shift. I mean, the like with this kind of the, the clashes of the uh, of the 1920s and the 1930s. The book was destroyed because of those, uh, the political elite. You, I mean, yeah, simple as that. The political elite, not the artistic elite. No, no, no. The uh, artists, they survived and they thrived. <laughs> oh, <laughs> didn't. No, no. Rochen and Stepanova, yes. No, no, no. But I mean, those who are kind of who made this album, yeah, they, they thrived. 
but in general yeah that, that's this is the kind of very I mean it's there is nothing black and white in the 1930s so it's not just evil Stalin and, and poor genius artists you know like uh, they uh, as I said like for me it was amazing to find an essay by Eisenstein uh, he wrote in 1939 where he earnestly and it's in his diaries I mean so he wasn't for and he didn't know he never published it it's an essay about national form and he kind of basically claims on that continuity I mean almost like an Antipinyanov's kind of uh, vein where he, he claims that evolution where this kind of trans the form uh, undergoes constant evolution and, and it, it's constant kind of the, the flaw and he sees that the national form is a kind of manifestation of, 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 of the same kind of continuity in, in, in the arts. So the, 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 the picture is more, much more complicated. There are people who kind of really thrived and who became like political establishment. I mean, Shklovsky was kind of under fire in the 1930s, 1940s, but then he emerged kind of as a kind of one of the key voices of the literary establishment in the 1950s, 1960s, 70s, kind of. Uh, so it's, it's not just a kind of uh, black and white. Uh, it's a very complex picture and I'm trying to kind of see uh, to engage with those discourses, whether they wrote uh, uh, the uh, uh, articles kind of under pressure or with a kind of in, in an earnest way to engage with that formula on a kind of theoretical level. Maybe I'll have one final question and this, uh, others few more to speak, but uh, um, I was just very curious at some point you made the juxtaposition of uh, uh, the different uh, protagonists in your book mm -hmm. actually engaging Soviet Central Asia in very, very different ways. You know, some uh, like Platon actually uh, spending extensive time and um, on the other side, I assume, you know, engaging local artists in a way that uh, that uh, Rochink and, and Stepanova never did. Uh, I'm just curious whether that's uh, um, that kind of uh, difference is purely a function of artist personality, so we can speak of certain genre logic in this. Because, for example, in, in film, you know, in Soviet Soviet documentary film of the late 1940s, is uh, entirely preoccupied with the representations of Soviet peripheries. You know, there are um, so many films in the 1940s of um, uh, you know. As, as, Soviet, uh, you know, dedicated to each Soviet Republic or to a particular phenomenon in the Soviet Republic, and, and that uh, really whole phenomenon of Soviet documentary cinema of this period, you know, has been called uh, geographical aesthetic by Raisa Sidinova, you know, but my, my point is that uh, um, maybe uh, for cinema, this preoccupation with, uh, with uh, you know, national uh, national form came a little later, and uh, and I'm just wondering whether there is a certain genre logic of this engagement with the uh, with the national content question. Uh, whether there are any principles you can distill, or is it primarily? I mean, granted that you're working with a number of individual writers, it's mm -hmm. with a sm very small number of, of writers and, and artists. It's very difficult to identify wider genre principles um, but I want to push you a little bit yeah and, and this is not like not what, what happens I mean I conclude with actually the uh, uh film he made I mean the this the Lynn film and most film during the uh, World War two uh, uh, moved to Almaty to Kazakhstan so the I mean Eisenstein he made uh, Ivan Grozny in Almaty right so it's a uh, and I, I conclude with Vyartov's film, uh, To Be a Front, uh, To You the Front, uh, which he made in 1940s, uh, in 1942. Uh, so to me, the, I, I, I see like the kind of the avant-garde attempt to, to, to kind of, in Eisenstein's film about Fergana, which he never concluded, but for which some footage uh, exists in 1939, uh, or Vyartov's 1934 uh, uh, Three Songs of Lenin or his uh, uh, lullaby. Uh, so to me, the kind of the, probably the cinema 
you're talking about this kind of state endorsed and uh, it's kind of this patok, a massive patok. Yeah. Mm -hmm. While here it, we've got this early, the, 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 this formula, national informed socialist content is pronounced. So everyone is trying to identify what it is, as well as what, what is socialist realism. Kind of in the time. So to me, basically, the kind of the met methodology is very simple. I looked how they conceptualized the notion of form in the 1920s, and I looked how they conceptualized it in the 1930s, in the in early 1940s, and I and I try to see kind of ruptures and continuities. In so it's as simple as that. And what what happens in the kind of 1950s and 1960s? I think the kind of the uh, overwhelming kind of nationalism, Stalin's nationalism, kind of Russo-centric tendency, which kind of definitely is evident in the late 1930s, where kind of the learning of Russian language becomes obligatory for everyone in, 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 in the republics. Uh, so the, um, this, and, and the World War II as well, kind of uh, really uh, uh, fueled that kind of preoccupation with, with kind of Russo-centrism. So I think that then you, you have that, I, I, this kind of ethnographic or um, uh, kind of another form of kind of Orientalism, which is very different mm -hmm. from this early experiment with the notion of form. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosa. So, we, thank you so much, Marianne. This was 